So, um, <clears throat> so welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for coming along. Um, it's always uh, a great pleasure to um, introduce these inaugural lectures. So this is the, the fifth um, inaugural lecture event that we've had this year. Um, so we're covering each of the departments in the faculty. And um, I think it's, uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm the outgoing but acting um, uh, dean of the faculty. Um, and so it's always a great pleasure to introduce these. And I think it's a particular pleasure for me to, to introduce this one as the last one of my tenure, um, because I particularly like physics. Um, I think you're a great community. Um, and it's just always good fun to come to, to physics events. The inaugural uh, lectures are particularly here to sort of celebrate our professors, our, our newly appointed professors, and uh, that means people who have recently become professors and also our very long-standing professors who we have poached from other institutions, as in the case of Ruth. Um, so um, that's really what it's for. It's not always the baby professors, it's not always the newly appointed ones, but it's the ones that are newly appointed uh, to Kings. Um, so we have two uh, such uh, talks today, and the emphasis we've always given in the inaugural lectures is that this, isn't, this is an academic talk, but we've really asked people to talk something about their journey, about how they've got to this point. So hopefully um, both uh, Ruth and Eugene will, will tell us a little bit about the journey that's taken them to this point. But our first speaker tonight is, is Ruth, and Ruth obviously very well known to us as the, as the head of physics. Um, um, uh, so, just give a little background uh, on Ruth. So, Ruth earned her PhD uh, from Cambridge in 1988, part of um, Stephen Hawking's relativity research group under the supervision of John Stewart. She then became a research associate at Fermilab and a McCormick Fellow at the Enrico uh, Fermi Institute at Chicago between 1988 and 1993, before coming back to the UK on a PPARC Advanced Fellowship and then a Royal Society URF. Um, uh, fast forwarding in, in 2005, she was appointed as a, a professor of maths and physics at Durham, so uh, uh, obviously a very uh, long-standing uh, professorial uh, uh, post here. Um, she held this post until she came to King's as the head of the Department of Physics um, and professor of theoretical physics here in 2021. Her fields of specialism are general relativity and cosmology. And Ruth is a very uh, distinguished uh, physicist of being awarded the Maxwell Medal by the IOP um, in 2006 and the Royal Society Wolfson Merit Award um, in 2011. She's currently also a visiting fellow at the Perimeter Institute at Waterloo in Canada. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to invite Ruth up to the stage to give us her talk on black holes and revelations. Whoa! <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Do we, are we okay now? Right. I warned them I have quite a loud voice, so they may want to uh, turn down the... <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't think I know how to speak quietly. So Mark, having uh, introduced me, I'm not sure what's left to say of my journey, um, but I did have this little slide to just describe roughly what my academic uh, life had been. So this is me as a PhD student. So the people who've, who've come, who've been undergraduates with me can have a little laugh at that one. Um, We've even got mullet in there, so that's very much of its time. Should I, should I turn this off and use the... Let's try this. I think this might be somewhat more successful. Okay, so um, I'm... Originally, this is my geodesic, I'm originally from the northeast of England, so I'm actually a genuine original Geordie, and I went to Cambridge uh, to study physics. Um, I always remember at school saying to my physics teacher, where's the best place to study physics? 
and he said, Cambridge. I said, oh, okay, I'll go there then. And I remembered sort of seeing the eyebrows go <laughs> right up. At the time, I think there wasn't, as, as a, I was at a girls' school, and I'm not entirely convinced that women were taken, or girls were taken seriously when they said they wanted to do maths and physics. But I was always really interested in how the world worked. However, on getting to Cambridge, I discovered that in order to do physics, I had to do chemistry and geology, and that didn't quite sit well with me because I knew I wanted to do theoretical physics. So unlike, uh, I think it's slightly unusual, but I've always known I wanted to do theoretical physics ever since reading a book on relativity or popular book on relativity during my O-level year. So that's GCSE for the youngsters of today. Um, and I read this sentence about how Einstein had been looking for a unified field theory. And the moment I read it, I knew that was what I wanted to do and what I would like to study. So basically, I've been doing that for the next uh, few decades. I won't admit to how long, though those many in the audience know exactly how long that is. Uh, so, I've been very lucky to be able to follow that passion. Uh, first of all, at Cambridge for seven years, studying, I was advised to change to maths, studying maths as an undergraduate, and then theoretical physics in the relativity group, which was a great place to be. A lot of fun at the time, um, and at the time, there hadn't really been successful female graduates from the relativity group, but I'm absolutely delighted that my contemporary here, the other first woman, sitting in the middle, who, uh, Anna Achukaro, who um, was also uh, in the group with me at the time, and we had a, a whale of a time. <clears throat> Happy days. I then went to Chicago, um, and I think this was a really valuable time to kind of break the formality that, you know, math, it's, it's useful being trained as a mathematician, but you sometimes get a little bit too fixated on details, so it was nice to, to be at an actual working lab. Um, and then I headed back to the UK and Mark has covered uh, the rest of my, my geodesic coming now to London and King's. So, now it's, I'm going to find it so hard to stand still because this is just so not me, but I'll do my best. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is my work on black holes because I seem to have been thinking about black holes most of my research career and I think they're absolutely amazing things. So why do I think that? Well, normally in physics, if we want to describe a phenomenon or something about the real world, we always have to make compromises. So, for example, a pendulum, if we look at the equation of motion of a pendulum, it's something called simple harmonic motion, and we can solve exactly for that. So we have a nice equation and a nice solution, but it's not quite what happens as you know, if you've ever seen one of those old grandfather clocks, they don't exactly keep perfect time. But what's different about black holes is that the mathematics that describes them is almost perfectly spot on. So this one line in the middle of this slide here is pretty much accurate, although I've <clears throat> chosen a non-rotating black hole just to make it look slightly nicer. But this black hole is described by a single line. And really, I don't think there's anywhere else in physics that where you get such a simple expression that is so close to exactly what's going on. So that's, that's what I think is amazing about them. So what are black holes? I know some people in the audience are very much familiar. I think they're such a, so, so ingrained in popular culture that we, we all sort of think we know what they are. But just to remind ourselves of, of what they actually are, they've been with us for quite a long time. They were first postulated in the 18th century by Mitchell, who proposed that gravity would attract light as well as matter, which we know to be true, and that if the star were big enough or concentrated enough, then that light would be trapped, and so it would be a dark star. 
And this, although at the time there was no other implication other than that the star wouldn't shine, uh, still, you know, this is, this is sort of our first uh, conceptual uh, birth, if you like, of the black hole. And we can use Newton's Newtonian physics to find the properties of this star and what its critical mass or radius might be. And we use that by a very, we do that by a very intuitive argument. We say that uh, the escape velocity, so we, we know that there's this concept of escape velocity where our kinetic energy, the energy in our motion, balances the gravitational potential energy. Both of those on this slide are given by their Newtonian expressions, a half mv squared, and the Newtonian potential energy, gmm on r. We put those two equal and ask when is v equal to c, and we see that it is if the radius of the star is 2 gm on c squared. So this is this little rs. And amazingly, that same relation, same expression, pops out of Einstein's general relativity, although I have to be honest and say that very much depends on how you define R, and that is really the difference usually between a relativist and other forms of physicist. We don't necessarily think that R means uh, radius or what you think it does. <clears throat> so taking that thought, um, what, you know, what do I mean by that statement? In Einstein gravity, uh, we relate matter, actually all forms of energy, to a curvature of space. And so what do we mean by curved space? Well, we take our Pythagoras relation, which is the square of the hypotenuse as the sum of the squares of the sides, and we change it to something a little more uh, wibbly-wobbly, as we say. So uh, in this case, we start adding functions. So in other words, our distance is not just measured by uh, these these little steps in X or Y or whatever you choose as your label. So the Einstein equations are simply a relation that tells you something about curvature of geometry, that's the left-hand side there, and how it's related to matter, which is the right-hand side, that T, uh, A, B. So that is all forms of energy, rest mass energy, momentum, stress, strain, anything that has energy. So these are, these are tensors. There's quite a lot hiding in that one line, but it is this, I think it was beautifully summed up by Wheeler, that uh, space, sorry, matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. Now in four or more dimensions, space-time can be empty, but it's not flat. And the space-time around a star is, uh, is what we call the Schwarzschild solution. And I've got to give a shout out to Schwarzschild because it's pretty amazing. This guy uh, calculated this solution less than a year after Einstein published his theory of general relativity while fighting on the uh, trenches, if you like, of World War I, which is, is <laughs> remarkable in any universe. And so what the Schwarzschild solution does is this is this one line again. But this one line, if you unpack it, gives you a set of rules about how to relate the labels that you put on your space and time to actual distances or time intervals. So in this case, the R that's in there tells you about the area of spheres, the area of something at a constant distance from the stars, 4 pi R squared. So that's familiar. But what R is not is the distance from the star. And you see that because of this factor here in the brackets uh, dividing this little increment, dr, how far you move. And again, that same bracket appears multiplying uh, the time coordinate, the dt bit. And so what that tells you is since as r gets small and approaches that special value, 2gm on c squared, this bracket goes to zero. So what that's telling you <clears throat> is essentially that time, or perceived time, is slowing down. And so what that means is if someone is 
sending signals out if you think of light as, as a wave and every time you hit the crest as like a beat, if it's, if it's clicking like this where I am near the black hole, as you go further and further away, that gets slower and slower. So a frequency of light drops, which means the wavelength gets bigger, which means it moves to the red in the spectrum, and so this is the phenomenon of gravitational redshift. And this is particularly extreme near a black hole. So moving to <clears throat> more, a more formal <laughs> side of black holes, I've described a little bit about what the Schwarzschild solution is, but it actually took 50 years after that was discovered before we felt or the community truly understood what the solution meant. And over a decade, from the early 60s to the early 70s, the properties of black holes were, were ironed out or, or gradually more and more was understood. And these were encapsulated in a series of theorems. So you can see it's quite uh, lying on this boundary between physics and mathematics. So there were the no hair theorems, that black holes were characterized by relatively few parameters, mass charge and angular momentum. There was the area theorem, that black holes only ever grow if you throw positive energy into them. And finally, the singularity theorems, which is that inside a black hole, there's lurking a singularity. Just watch Star Trek if you want to know what one of those is. So even though all this development was going on and people felt that they understood what black holes were, there was still quite a healthy skepticism. And you often sort of see that in very formal theoretical physicists. So this is a, a famous bet between Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne over whether or not black holes existed. And it was essentially uh, an insurance policy so that if they weren't discovered, at least someone got something out of it. Um, but how, would, how are we even going to be able to confirm that there's a black hole? I mean, after all, they're black. So how do we see one? So there are, I'm going to just give several <clears throat> ways in which we, we've actually confirmed that well, what we believe are black holes are there. So there's first of all a, an indirect detection. So over a number of years, um, astronomers looked at stars near the center of our galaxy and spotted that they seemed to whip round very fast. So that you see them coming in and then they whip round very fast something very heavy, sort of millions of solar masses, and very small and very dark. And so it was gradually realized that there was a small supermassive object at the center of our galaxy, which really could be nothing other than a supermassive black hole. So hence the uh, wonderful uh, names of Muse's song. So. If I can stop that. Ah. Good. So the other way we see black holes is actually to listen to them and listening to them merging. So this is, uh, it's, been, it's been so exciting actually the last decade in black hole physics because in uh, 2015, when advanced LIGO switched on, well, almost the first thing they heard while they were still commissioning the detector was this massive signal that was way above what they were actually expecting to hear. And they realized, no, this really was two heavy black holes crashing together. And because black holes are so simple and have so few numbers associated with them, it's actually possible to be quite precise, or relatively speaking, um, about their properties simply by looking at the way they ring down in the same way that drums have a very characteristic sound when you beat them. Different size black holes have different sounds. And then the other, There we go. And another way that we, we feel that we know about black holes is actually seeing them directly. So most black holes uh, have an environment, some sort of dust or gas around them, and this usually starts getting sucked in into some what we call an accretion disk. And because the gravitational fields are so strong, the, the material heats right up and then starts emitting. 
And so it's not that we're seeing the black hole, it's more that we're seeing stuff being sucked into it. But what do we actually see? Well, the black hole, again, the gravity is so strong that we see quite a complex image. You can see here that the light just goes directly from this material. There's some that comes from around the back of the black hole. That's some that takes a spin around the black hole before getting to us. And basically, what you're seeing is light from, from behind the black hole. It's sort of, it plays tricks on you. So that what you see isn't really this pretty image that normally artists uh, draw, but rather the image from interstellar, which is this you know, quite complex and very pretty um, image of this accretion disk with, with the sort of characteristic ring there. So in 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration uh, actually announced that they'd seen the black hole in the center of our nearest galaxy and seen the shadow that it leaves um, for the light emerging from the vicinity of the black hole. Now, this is an incredible achievement. I think I, I read it sort of the resolution that's needed, because these black holes are so small, uh, is, is roughly equivalent to a seeing a tennis ball on the moon. But of course, a tennis ball on the moon, we would be looking with much more, more like visible light, which has a much shorter wavelength, whereas these observations are done in the radio spectrum, which has long wavelengths. And so, again, second-year optics, if we have any physics students here, um, are, what you see is uh, that we have an absolute limit to the resolution of a telescope, which is based on a diffractive limit, which is here. If we, if we observe with shorter wavelengths, we do better, or a longer baseline, we do better. And the amazing thing about this collaboration is they use the whole Earth as a baseline. But of course, we can't stick radio telescopes over every single spot on the Earth. So there was a real tour de force of uh, image, uh, understanding the image from all these sort of just this, this um, sparse array of radio telescopes. That was, that was really cool. Um, other black holes, well, maybe in the very early universe, there were sort of, freak, uh, sort of freak perturbations which then caused gravitational collapse and relatively light black holes, so black holes, say, the mass of the Earth or less. And these are called primordial black holes. So these are, are, are things that we think might exist, but we have no evidence. And these really take us more towards the quantum regime. So, I want, now want to just spend a few minutes, and I better check how I don't have very much time left now. This is the, the fun bit of black holes, the bit that, that I enjoy thinking about. So black holes are quite tantalizing in mixing classical properties with quantum physics. So classically is what I've been talking about so far, and now quantum mechanically is just what I want to say a few words about before I get uh, shooed off the, off the stand. So um, back again in that period where we started to understand black holes, it was realized that if a black hole uh, was truly black, then we had a bit of a problem because it was possible to essentially take all the junk in your universe and throw it into the black hole and clean up the place, which meant that you were reducing entropy. And whatever else we do, we never want to lose the second law of thermodynamics. And so it was, could realize the black holes had to carry entropy. They understood that meant they therefore radiated. And of course, that led to the uh, seminal work of Stephen Hawking proving this using quantum field theory. So uh, again, because we know that black holes radiate, it turns out that their temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. So as they radiate, they lose energy, they get lighter, they get hotter. And this means that there's a runaway process known as black hole evaporation. Um, and this, of course, has occupied the physics community for a long time. What happens uh, if a black hole radiates away completely? What's happened to what went into making it in the first place? Because all that's left is thermal radiation. So this is what's known as the information loss paradox, although Honestly, I, I always wonder really why information loss is a paradox if you, I suppose I should be careful, but if dealing, for example, with central administration. <laughs> so, 
I didn't say that. Um, however, I think there's other interesting questions uh, about black holes. Is there a coarse-grained aspect to black holes? Uh, one idea is that maybe the area of a black hole is quantized. How do we know what the event horizon is? Relativists really are time lords. We think four-dimensionally, whereas, and so our event horizon is something that we decide from the infinite future, whereas we experience the world very much in the moment. And there is a sort of, there is, and so does quantum physics, and there's a bit of a, a tension there that's interesting. And perhaps the most important, can we check any of this anyway? And so I think <clears throat> due to time, I will just say one of the things that I'm currently working on. So um, I've become involved in a consortium that is looking towards constructing more of a quantized black hole. And analog gravity is a proposal to test aspects of strong gravity or black holes or other extreme gravitational environments in a laboratory with systems where the, the systems have similar mathematical properties. So for example, here in uh, Silke Weinfurtner's Black Hole Laboratory in Nottingham, this is a draining vortex which acts very similarly to a rotating black hole. And what we are currently doing is we've built a, we, that's very, generous to myself, but they <laughs> have built a draining superfluid helium vortex, which is, we're hoping, will eventually be a quantum black hole analog. So here, there's a little um, magnetically coupled disk spinning at the bottom that turns a propeller, that turns the helium, that uh, then goes up, gives you a nice vortex there. And we, what we're interested in are fluctuations, little ripples on the surface. And we see that by looking at distortions of a patterned disk image. So what we're hoping is because superfluid has quantized angular momentum, we're kind of hoping that will lead us to a quantum black hole. Now, in the interests of time, I've, I'm going to not be able to talk about this last little bit, which is uh, quantum tunneling black holes, but maybe you can catch me over drinks but this is what might destroy the universe. Uh, so <laughs> I'll leave you with that thought. So just to wrap up, I mean, I'm, I mean, I hope I've persuaded you that black holes are fascinating objects, but I've probably persuaded you that I think they're fascinating objects. We know they exist in nature and they can be described by beautiful mathematics, but they're also telling us something about really fundamental physics and quantum physics, the way the quantum world mixes with uh, gravity. And um, yeah, I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Malcolm Faber and I'm head of the TPPC group, uh, that's Theoretical Particle Physics and Cosmology. Uh, I'm giving the vote of thanks tonight because the head of department normally gives the vote of thanks, but Ruth's the head of department, so she can't give herself a vote of thanks. So yeah. giving a vote of thanks for your boss is a bit like doing a high wire act without a safety net. There's, a, there's an art to striking the perfect balance. You want to be respectful, but Ruth's a northerner, so if I suck up to her, she won't stand for it. So, as you've heard, uh, uh, like Eugene, Ruth works at the intersection of particle physics and general relativity, often in a cosmological setting. Uh, she didn't get time to mention her most uh, famous work tonight, which is, uh, she spoke a lot about black holes, but one of the most significant things that she did during her career was looking at black holes in higher dimensions, because we believe that String theories suggest that higher dimensions might exist. And when you look at those black holes in higher dimensions, they're not necessarily as stable as they are in lower dimensions. And some of her work, her, her most uh, impactful work with, with La Flamme, perhaps, uh, arguably, but probably, uh, resulted in a, a very beautiful, very concise physics review letters, which uh, is, contains a lot of good mathematics, but also a lot of physical insight. And, and as you know, uh, PRLs are only four pages long, and yet she's got more than a thousand citations for that. So that's what we define as a good day in the office in our group, right? <laughs> and when I first saw Ruth at UK cosmology meetings about 25 years ago, she was working on black holes and topological defects back then. Uh, and she was a notable that she was always doing 
more formal calculations than the rest of us who were just sort of throwing stuff around. Um, and expertise in these two lines of research proved very valuable a few years later when people started getting interested in brain worlds. So that's the idea that the universe is a surface inside higher dimensions. And she was well placed to write very many uh, impactful papers in that area, which she did. Um, and sometimes her research uh, takes a more phenomenological flavor, but sometimes she's much more mathematical, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, some, in fact, she works in areas that are very relevant for string theory, which has got strong overlaps with the m activity in the maths department here at KCL. And she's well respected by both communities. So, And as you've seen since then, she's worked on many things, including the destruction of the universe and uh, phenomena such as topological defects in fluids. So as you know, uh, in 2020, Ruth embarked on a new uh, chapter of her career accepting the role of the head of department at King's here. And her, her appointment came at a particularly challenging time. And yet she's embraced the role and found her feet within the complicated and frenetic world of KCL, fighting all the problems we make for her with good grace. And she has a refreshing northern directness that I certainly appreciate. And she maintains a black humor despite the inevitable crises that one has to put up with as head of department. Uh, despite her commitments, and she has a lot of commitments in that role, um, she still manages to be a regular attendee at our journal clubs, our research journal clubs, where her inputs are always valuable and treasured. And uh, her PhD students obviously have a very high opinion of her. Um, in addition to her academic prowess, Ruth is also known for her talent in playing the fiddle, which if you think about it, is a bit like keeping a bunch of physicists in line. It requires skill, patience, and occasionally the ability to make a quick adjustment when things go out of tune. So if she ever steps down from being head of a department, I'm, I'm looking forward to having her around more in a research capacity because it's become very clear to me since she's arrived here that despite her already huge publication record, uh, she still has a huge, amount of give, uh, a huge amount to give to the research community. And, uh, and this makes her, in my opinion, a wonderful addition to the people here at KCL Physics. And we are very glad to have her here. So let's thank Ruth again for her wonderful talk. So, um, so thank you, uh, thank you, Ruth, and, and thank you, Malcolm, for, for thanking Ruth. Um, <laughs> maybe thank you, me, for thanking Malcolm, for thanking Ruth. Um, I have to say, there's a very nice, I'm very relieved, actually, that um, having Ruth just told us about uh, the destruction of the universe, um, Eugene is going to give us a talk, um, which is called Dreaming of the Last Turtle, How Do You Start the Universe? So at least we have the expertise to, to uh, cope with the last talk in the next talk. Um, but anyway, um, I'd, I'd really just like to say a few words about Eugene, so, so biographical uh, words. So Eugene um, uh, received his PhD in astronomy and astrophysics in 2004 from the University of Chicago. He was then a postdoc at Yale, um, from 2004 to 2007, and then at Columbia until 2010. Um, he uh, then came back to the UK um, and was at Cambridge um, for a couple of years before joining uh, King's um, as a, in the Department of Physics as a lecturer in 2012. And then later in 2012, senior lecturer in 2015, reader in 2018, and uh, becoming professor in theoretical physics in 2021. Um, so besides dreaming of, uh, well, obviously dreaming of turtles and how to start the universe, um, Eugene's interests are broadly in early uh, university, uh, uh, university, and early universe cosmology. So welcome very much, Eugene, to the stage now. Thank you. It's Windows. I have no idea how to press the button. Ah, there we go. How do you play this thing? Control F. Control F? Nope. See, Windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
thank you very much um, for the introduction. Can you all hear me from here? You can? Okay, very good. So, uh, oh, oh, okay. So I'm now stuck to this place. So, um, so right. Um, we all start somewhere, and I think Katie, who was my first PhD student here, would appreciate this slide. And, um, and, and that's me, who's learning Kung Fu for the first time, and that's my advisor. And my, my PhD is to like, punch up special relativity, right? So my job is to break special relativity. That was my first PhD, uh, my, my first, uh, PhD project, actually. So my PhD advisor is actually Sean Carroll, who's much, much more famous than I am. Um, and, and you know, in my career, I've been fortunate to have many, many mentors that give me lots of, lots of good advice. And uh, I'd just like to give you like, a sampling of them. And Sean's advice to me when I finish is don't write too many papers on the same topic. Um, and I think that I took a lot from him in the sense that I, I embraced this idea that you should be broad, right? You should not just do one thing again and again and again and again. So um, hopefully my career actually like, shows that. So, and, and in my first postdoc, I went to Yale where I ended up doing something else, like gravitational waves, inflationary theory, and primordial non-Gaussianities. They're just complicated names, basically related to early universe cosmology. And I, I, I was uh, Richard Easter, who was a professor there at the time, and I was his first hire. So he, when I came to his office, he said, Eugene, I just hired with my startup. You better don't fail me. Right, so, oh, great. Um, but Richard turns out to be a really, really good, not just a good mentor, but really a great friend of mine. And, and we were very, very productive together. And the advice that he gave me, which I think was, I think his best advice, is that just don't work on the things that you can do. Right, work on the things that are actually important. Because sometimes when you know a lot of knowledge, a lot of things, when you have a hammer, you just want to punch all the nails. And his comment said, don't do that. Right? Just find the important things and work on those. After a year, I ended up in Columbia um, and, um, and just, you know, embracing Sean's advice that I should do different things. I stopped doing cosmology stuff and started working on other stuff. You know, I started working on string theory, I started working on theory of nonlinear dynamics, I um, work on weak lensing statistics. Um, a friend of mine said, Eugene, why is the outburst of astrophysics all of a sudden? Um, and my, the, the, the person, I, so there are many people at Columbia, but I think the person who, in a sense, influenced me the most is a professor at Columbia, uh, Lam Hui. Um, and I have very fond memories of Lam and I just sitting in a coffee shop at 10 p.m. just working, like, you know, we're just working together because we share the same favorite coffee shop. And, um, and, 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 and his advice to me is like, don't be too quick, Eugene. Uh, uh, what, what does that mean? It means that I oftentimes when we work with him, I would just make leaps of intuition, which oftentimes gets me to the wrong place. And his advice to me was like, you know what, don't do that, right? Just, you can make leaps of intuition, but check, be methodical about it, don't be too quick. And, and, and I think, Roughly speaking, he said, don't just jump, like go deep and just really understand what you're actually doing. So that's really another advice that I, I, I like, like to in, um, integrate into my science. So after that, I crossed the pond and I end up here in the, this side of the Atlantic Ocean uh, at Cambridge. And at, at that time, after what, 10 odd years in academia, I was feeling the itch. I was like, you know what, I'm getting bored. I want to do something new. Um, and, and my boss at, um, at Cambridge at the time was Paul, Paul Shalak, and, um, and he was actually at the time trying to build a computational, uh, like high performance computing cluster at Cambridge. And he said, why do you give up on all your numerical work on primordial gravitational wave in those times? It was great, why, why do you stop working on it? And obviously the reason I stopped working on it is because I got bored of it. Um, but I was feeling the itch of wanting to do something. And um, so I thought, well, Numerics, right? Numerical relativity, why not, right? Just like try something new. Let's do something new now. Um, and, and I end up meeting with Pao, who's here, um, and, and Hal Finker, who's actually somebody I know from Yale. Um, and we came up and laid the groundwork of something that become what kind of like driven my career for the last 10 years or so, which is the numerical relativity code, Gia Chombo. So, um, so here I am, right? So after that, I um, got hired at King's, here I am. And uh, my, basically my research is using high performance computing to investigate cosmology and fundamental physics. And, and I was writing this talk last night 
And I was like putting, finding, like Googling and finding all the faces. And as they start occupying all the space, I mean, I'm starting around out of space here. And I realized, oh my God, I'm old, right? So I'm, I have so many students now. So, so, which is great, right? So I'm really glad to see a lot of them here. Um, so, so, so this, uh, the, if, 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 I think that there is a saying that you all have heard before that your, your career, your science is built on the shoulders of giants, right? I think the more accurate statement is that your career is built on the shoulders of graduate students, right? <laughs> the other people who actually do your stuff. Um, so, so thank you to all of them. Without them, I won't be here. Right? So, um, so then I got made professor in 2021, and, um, and this is the tweet I put out when I found out that I was a professor. And, and when you, if you have never been professor before, you, you get to choose your title. And I want to call myself Professor of Awesome or Professor of Cool, but my wife say that you, you are just a kid, you should just grow up. Uh, so I end up with the pedestrian professor of theoretical physics. But at this stage, I, I was starting to feel the each again, and I say, you know what, what should I, want, what, what should I do? I mean, now you're a professor, what should you want to do? So, so, what, so the question I ask, what's the important questions? that needs solving, that I have learned enough Kung Fu to attack, right? So I have this question, what, what, what should I do? Is it well, cosmological origins, why not, right? So let's just ask the hard questions here. So, so what I'm gonna, this, is, this is kind of my journey, uh, and now what I'm gonna talk about is um, the topic of my talk, like dreams of the final turtle. So what does it actually mean? So, so we off, like this whole story where this old man say, oh, you know, what, what, why does, how does the earth float? in the sky, say, so, well, he's standing on a turtle. So, well, then he say, okay, well, what's, on, what's, what's the turtle standing on? It's another turtle. And what's the turtle standing on? Another turtle, right? So it's the origins of the universe, it's an infinite towers of turtles. Right? Is, there, is there a way that to stop? Can there be an origin at all? So, so to, to do that, we, we start by how to science. So what do you mean by doing science? So we want to do science, right? the basic idea of doing science is that, you know, like say for example, your question is that, what is the classical law of motion? So what do you do? You set up a cannon, you fire a cannon, and then you see where it landed, you know, like that stick man is the experimentalist. So, so how do you check your theory? So you say, okay, wow, I set up an initial condition, I say here's a cannon, I fire at certain velocity, at certain angle, I propose some theory of dynamics. If you're a Newton, then you write down the theory of, you know, second law of, uh, uh, of second law of Newton's second law. And then you make some predictions. And then if your theory is right, then it landed exactly where you predicted, you make an observation and say, aha, I found my theory. So I have, I have derived, if I have proven and checked experimentally what is the classical law of motion. Now things get slightly more complicated if you want to do quantum mechanics. Right? So okay, well, now the cannon is the quantum object, so it's fuzzy. The cannonball is slightly fuzzy. But technically, uh, the guy, the person there should both be fuzzy, but let's just have a classical observer, and say, so what do you do? You do a very similar thing. You set up some initial conditions, set up some state, and then you propose some theory of dynamics, and you make predictions. But now, since it's quantum mechanics, it is not precise. You, you, what you propose is a probability distribution function. You say, okay, well, at some, some radius, this is the cannonball has 95% chance of ending right here. And then you check. But you can't check with just one cannonball, right? You need to, if you like, understand, you need to say, okay, well, my, my proposal is that the cannonball can land in this area. So I need to send many, many cannonballs. I need to repeat my experiments. So I need to, if you like, construct this probability distribution function by doing many, many, many experiments. Because if you get one cannonball and it's way out there, you might just be luck, you know? So, so if you like, if to check your theory, you need, a PDF, you need to repeat your experiments. Now, let's just take a step back and say, okay, well, how do we apply these laws of physics or the law of doing experiments to the universe? Right, so our universe is special. Oops, why is it fine there? Okay, so our universe is special. So what do we mean by special, right? So, so what, 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 what is, what, why is the universe special? So you can look at, you can build expensive telescope and look at the sky and map up all the galaxies and then you can just see the universe in a very, very big scale. And then what we say, the words that we use if you're a cosmologist is that the universe is homogeneous, isotropic, and spatially flat. 
what does mean in actual human words is that everywhere looks the same in all directions. And if you draw very big triangles in space, the triangles add up to 180 degrees. So if, you can, if the universe is not flat, and you draw a big triangle, the triangle doesn't add up to 180 degrees. So that's what we mean by spatially flat. So this is kind of special, right? Because there is so many other ways for the universe to be, to be completely crazy, but it's not. It is actually very well ordered, very well organized. Um, when we say special, we often call it problems. For some reason, special is, specialness is a problem. So we always call them as, as cosmological problems, so the universe is special. And what do we mean? Let's just take, for example, take for, as, as, a, as for to be specific, the idea that the universe is spatially flat. So if you draw triangles, you get a 180 degrees. So you can measure this, how non-flat this universe is by this parameter called omega, which is called a curvature parameter. And if it's omega more than one, then you add up all the, the, the angles in the triangle is more than 180 degrees. If it's less than one, then it is, it is uh, add up to uh, less than 180 degrees. And if it's equal to one, then it's exactly 180 degrees. So this is a question of expectation, right? So when we say it's a flatness problem, why, why, when we, what we see today, what we measure is the last slide, it's one. So it is flat. So why, why is it a problem? Right? So because it, because it is, oh, this should be one actually. So because, it, because it, is, it is expectation, right? So we observe this actually equals to one, sorry. Uh, but we expected something that's not one. So we, we measure something that's one and we expected something that's not one, hence it's a problem. This sort of makes sense. Until you can ask the question, so what do we actually expect? So why do we expect the universe to be one, or why do we expect the universe to be something that's not one? It's a question of expectation. You need a prediction. And saying that it is flat, is special, is not good enough as an answer. So what is an expectation? If you, expectation just means that you are drawing from some distribution. You need an ensemble of possibilities. So here's a, just what we call probability distribution function. So the x-axis is just the curvature, for example, and the probability is, you know, if, and the curve is just the probability. You could be like the, the one on the left, you could be one on the middle, you could be one on the right. Um, and these are, these are expectation values, these are expectations, and so you say that, okay, well, what theory does this come from? Now, the, the first two, I, in, the, in the words I say is predictive, right? Predictive just means that this actually can make a prediction. But the last one is not predictive because it's not what we call not normalizable in straight lines, so it can go from infinity to infinity, so it's not a predictive probability distribution function. So, so but the ultimate question is that where does this come from, right? What do we expect the universe to be? So, so let's just see, as, from, see this problem from the eyes of a cosmology. Right? Now, so how the science, how the cosmology? This is what we see today. If you look back a little bit, you see this cosmic microwave background. That's about a year, the universe when it's 14 billion years old. And if you look, at, look back a little bit more, just slightly earlier, not too much earlier, um, you see something called a Big Bang nuclear synthesis, where neutrons and protons becomes the atoms that we see today. But if you just want to look back a little bit more, it's question marks. Question mark in the sense that we just don't know, right? We can't look back that far. And that's it, that is all kind of we know about the universe. So, that, so if you want to, if you think back of the cannon again, you're tracing back the, flow, the flight of the cannonball, but you never reach to the start. You somewhere and say, okay, well, I can't see anymore. That's, that's, that's how far we can see. So, which means we don't get to set up initial conditions. We don't get to repeat experiments. We don't know what the probability distribution is. So if we, 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 there's only one universe and one, one timeline. So we can't repeat the experiments. So then how do we compute expectations? So why do we say those cosmological problems are problems? Because we, we don't know what expectations are. You don't know what, it, you, you know what to expect. So there are three logical options, right? So, so this, I've just squeezed this thing into this tiny little, thing here, and then you say, okay, well, there's some theory of dynamics and some cosmological initial conditions. There are three logical options. There's some initial conditions to get exactly what, so we can say, okay, well, maybe we can set up the initial condition, we set up the canon, such that you get exactly what we get, what we see today. And this is kind of what this is, uh, this is what we're doing, right? Say, so, okay, well, this big tofu is all the possible 
ways that initial, the universe can start, and God decided to book right here. That's exactly what we need, right? So this is Pandora's picture, and this is obviously crazy, right? I mean, come on, right? You're just saying that we give up, right? We don't do science. We've given up on trying to understand what initial conditions are. The second option is that you can invent some theory that tells you what the initial conditions are. That's one option. And the third option, which is actually what cosmologists, for various sociological reasons, end up doing, is that, well, maybe we don't care about cosmological initial condition. Maybe we can invent some theory of dynamics that predict the same outcome, regardless of what initial condition is. So you say, don't worry about where the cannon is pointing. There are some dynamics that drives you to see what you see today. So this is, in the sense, what we, you know, we as in the royal cosmologists, we chose to do. Um, so, so what is inflation, right? This idea, this theory of dynamics has a name, we call it inflation. And inflation is, is the word is that an early period of exponential expansion of space. But basically what he's saying is this, that at some point, very, very early universe, space is stretched from each other faster than the speed of light. So there's a, there's a completely different talk why this solves all the problems, but it does solve all the problems. It makes a prediction or a post-diction of homogeneity, isotropy, and especially flatness. But more importantly, it makes an even amazing prediction. It is, this is a prediction, right? Does, you, you get this for free. You don't put this in. That it predicts the cosmic structure. It's, it predicts how the fluctuation, how the galaxies is distributed. And, uh, and if you like, this is amazing. No? It combines the physics of general relativity, cosmology, and quantum mechanics to give you this answer and give you this exactly thing that has been confirmed by many, many experiments. So this is. Hooray, right? We should just start distributing Nobel Prizes now. But the problem is that it doesn't quite work. So what's going on, right? So okay, well, this is where I step into a region where people think that I am a crackpot or heretic. But no, right? So, so suppose if your initial conditions is inhomogeneous initially. Remember that inflation is designed so that it solves the initial condition problem by saying it's irrelevant. But here, it turns out that if you actually do the math, right, you do the math using a very big computer, that if you choose some initial condition that is slightly crazy, not too crazy, sometimes it inflates and sometimes it doesn't inflate. So in fact, this is work here done with it at KCL, like Katie, Josu, Matt, and Panos, uh, uh, my PhD student who will work on this, on the numerical simulations of this. So, so what this is saying is that whether inflation works or not depends itself on its initial condition. So it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem of making initial condition irrelevant. So the last turtle, which is inflation is supposed to be, needs another turtle in the bottom. So, so this is kind of a conceptual retreat, right? So now you're saying, okay, well, it's in material dynamics that predict the same outcome. Instead, of, regardless of it become with generic initial conditions. But when we talk about the word generic, it means where we have certain expectations. What is generic is an expectation. So you need to come up again back to the probability distribution function and where does it come from? Right. So we need to go deeper. Right. So fortunately or unfortunately, inflation is not the end of the world, right? It is an effective theory. It means that it must come from some theory of quantum gravity. It's, you need to derive it, if you like. And we all know that the theory of quantum gravity is string theory. So, so what does string theory tell you about inflation? So let's just start by talking basically what string theory is. Right? This is a two-slide introduction of what string theory is. A string theory needs at least 10 dimensions. And because the universe, we see we have four dimensions, you know, one time and three space. The other six dimensions must be curled up. So here's a picture of the corrupt dimension. So you have one time dimension plus three large space dimension and hour dimensions and six companion dimensions. And you add them up, you get 10 total dimensions. Now, these extra dimensions are curled up, right? So what do you mean by, say, we say it's compact, but they don't like to stay the same size. So you make them very, very small. They are like, they want to either blow up, we call it decompactify, or they collapse into nothing, which is we call collapse to nothing. So, so on its own, they want to just do this crazy stuff and they are not well behaved. So how do you keep the extra dimension small? You need to add stuff. Now you are not adding stuff. You add, what you do is, do is add extra energy fields. When you say add, it means you write down equations on your formula. You write down equations on, your, on the paper. You just say, okay, let's put it in by hand, if you like. But you add these energy fields, you provide tension, and you can stabilize them. 
And the string theory just basically say that the physics of the large dimension depends on how you compactify the small dimension. So how you add out the fields matters to what the large dimension is doing. Which also means that you can get large dimension physics by doing fancy things in the small dimensions. So one way, and very, very clever people have realized that they can actually get inflation by putting in these extra fields in a very clever way. Right, so this, you know, you don't have to know what it is. It is just some clever way of getting inflation by putting D3, D3 bar brain in a warp probe, blah, 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 blah. There's a, there's a parenthesis there, it's still controversial. People still fight over this. But it's a way of getting inflation from, from string theory. You just need to put in the right number of fields in the right number of way in a particular configuration. Very fine to you, but sure, you can do it. So here's a mathematical prescription of doing it. Right? So here's a, you start with 10 dimensions, you choose the topology or geometry of your six extra dimensions, you want those, you add extra fields, you go and find solutions, and da da da, da profit, right? You write papers. What they don't tell you is that 3.5 is that if you, make, you need to make a lot of assumptions. You need, and why do you need to make a lot of assumptions? Because you can't calculate otherwise. The math is just too hard. So the people say it, you need to be, you need to have control over your calculation. Basically, it just says that if you try to be as general as you can, you give up, right? It's just too hard to calculate. So, and one important assumption that you make when you derive string inflation is that you assume the initial conditions of the large dimension are actually homogeneous. So you are kind of assuming the answer to get, to get what you want. So the morally correct way of doing this thing is that it's, it's actually to change the idea, to change it a little bit. So instead of like the first two steps are the same, but what you really need to do is that you need to add tensions. When you add tension, you want to solve the equation without an assumption. You want to be as general as you want. You want to solve the equations. And then you check the geometry of the large dimension. You don't assume that the large dimensions are homogeneous originally. So you don't assume the answer, if you like. So, so this is kind of reaching the end of my talk, which is because that's the end of my science. So this is where we are right now. What I'm going to do, at least my plan to do in the next few years here, um, it's just, well, we want to solve this problem, right? We want, when I say that you can't solve this problem, oh, I mean that you can't solve this problem with pen and paper. But we have big computers and amazing code. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to solve these equations with computers. So then, and you know, if computers solve things that you cannot solve by hand, so hopefully what we, what, what we want is to construct an expectation value of cosmological initial conditions from solving the equations basically exactly, and, um, and the answers we want, how inhomogeneous in the initial conditions, in what way is it predictive? If it is, what is our expectation? So, it's, you know, it's a string theory, the final turtle of cosmology, and we're looking forward to continuing the journey. Thank you very much. I'm the only thing standing between you and drinks now, but it's Eugene, so. Um, uh, Eugene's been with us here at KCL for many years, and we're very lucky to have such a singular scientist. Uh, we often use the term, it's not rocket science, but uh, it wouldn't matter if it was, because uh, Eugene used to be a rocket scientist. His first degree was in engineering, and he was part of the Malaysian space program. I think he came to the conclusion that that wasn't going anywhere fast, so he decided to embark on the career trajectory that was explained to you today. Uh, both of our lecturers are theoretical particle cosmologists, which means they put quantum fields, the quantum fields of particles, inside the curved space-time of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And, um, and the thing is that Einstein's theory of general relativity is very nonlinear. It's difficult to solve. It gets very messy very quickly. So usually when people actually put stuff in such a background, they keep it quite flat and they give it little perturbations. And, and some, when they solve Einstein's full equations of general relativity, when they have coalescing black holes, so that so they allow all the nonlinearities to go crazy, then they don't put any matter in there at all. And I think about 10 years ago, or well, exactly when, presumably, when Paul Shellard harassed you, um, Eugene and his collaborators decided, wouldn't it be good if we could do proper general relativity with matter in there and fields and everything? And this is not an easy thing to do. And, you know, 
he's developed with his collaborators Pow and this thing called GR Chombo, and it seems to work, right? And, and it's really impressive, and this huge effort is the kind of thing that can only be achieved when smart people devote quite a significant fraction of their life to a single purpose, and it's very admirable, right? So now he's using this code, as you saw, he's gonna be using this code to try and understand the origin of the universe. Um, but he's also used it to work out stuff like how lumps of quantum matter might coalesce and how they might form gravitational waves. Uh, and, and already the early papers that uh, I've noticed when I go to conferences, uh, they say, oh, I'm at King's, and now they go, oh, Eugene Lin's at King's, isn't he? He wrote that paper about initial conditions and inflation. So obviously this is giving him a lot of uh, respect internationally already. Yeah, so basically he's no slouch, okay. So what about the character of Eugene himself? Okay, well, Eugene's body is a temple. <laughs> He barely drinks and he runs regularly, injury allowing, and he's blessed with a fine brain. These factors mean that the clock rate on his CPU is quite high. So interacting with him can sometimes be a bit like uh, communicating with a 56K modem, and one has to get him to slow down to follow his physics, at least I do. Uh, in seminars, he always asks, can I ask a stupid question? And then he never asks a stupid question. Um, when we hired him, I remember saying to my colleagues at the time, he'd be an awesome teacher. Well, he's, he's surpassed that, okay? He's one of the best teachers we have for the undergraduates. And the thing is that a lot of people, we, as physicists, we complain that we feel that our syllabuses are dumbing down, not Eugene. Eugene always teaches, at a tr he manages to drag the students to a tremendously high level. Um, he taught general relativity using differential forms to third year undergraduates, which I still, and I get new lecturers who come along. He also changes course a lot because he gets bored very quickly, as you've seen, and he wants to teach a new course. And, and I get new lecturers come and they say, they take over one of Eugene's course, and I say, don't try to do what Eugene did. You can't do what Eugene did. Because, uh, you know, I don't know how he does it. He drags the undergraduates through it through sheer force of energy and will, and he manages to, it works, and the undergraduates love it. But uh, I'm not sure anybody else can do quite what he does because he's very special and he does things other teachers can't. As blackboards slowly disappear across campus, only to be replaced by vastly inferior whiteboards, the dreaded visualizer, and even worse, the utterly horrifying efforts at different kinds of electronic multimedia replacements. Eugene, like me, has been pushing hard to complain to whoever that will listen that we really need blackboards, blackboards, blackboards everywhere whenever possible. However, even my zeal cannot match his passion for Hagamoro chalk, which is deemed essential by him for the very continuation of scientific literacy and civilization. He's got a huge amount of time for his PhD students and he's well respected and loved in our group. We've all been delighted to see how happy Sophie and of course Astra have made him. Like quite a few of us in physics, over the past few years, he's been passionate behind the scenes in improving the equality and diversity of our group, which is not easy, but we're still trying. When I took over as head of group, the first thing I did was go to Eugene and tell him I would need his help. Since then, he's been a constant source of advice and a sounding board for me, and I'm grateful. This relationship works well because neither of us is forthright, opinionated, or contrarian. However, you might be surprised to learn that we don't always agree, but that's okay, Eugene, you can't be right all the time. <laughs> so, my friend, you finally got your professorship. It's very well deserved. Congratulations. Let's thank Eugene again. So, uh, thank you, Malcolm. So, uh, Malcolm was wrong, so unfortunately, I'm the last thing between you and the drinks. Um, but uh, I just want to reflect on, on, on a couple of things. So, firstly, thank you very much to, to Ruth um, and to Eugene for those uh, great talks and telling us um, really about, um, you know, the, the, the person behind the science as well as uh, the science. I wanted to take two, two things. I really like the... Uh, Work on the important things, not just the things that you can do. And I think, you know, as a motto for anybody in academia, I couldn't think of anything better advice than that that you'd receive. Eugene, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm old, right? 
this is the person who wants to call himself the professor of awesome. Um, and um, and as, uh, as uh, Malcolm said, uh, you're an awesome teacher as well as uh, 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 a key uh, researcher. And Ruth, really we're going to have to call on you to explain to the central, inf uh, central administration in the university that information loss should not be a paradox um, and we really should stop losing student marks. It's really unacceptable. But I really think that that is um, yeah, that's something for us to, to take away for sure. Um, and I think, you know, the physicist's perspective on university administration um, may actually be the key to sorting out some of the challenges that we have here. Anyway, as I said at the beginning, or just now, unfortunately, I am the last thing between you and the drinks, so let's just get to the point where we get to the drinks. It's traditional in inaugural lectures not to uh, have questions for the speakers, but the purpose of the drinks is to mix, mingle, and to ask Ruth and Eugene as many questions as you like. So eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.